Welcome to the Rotary Membership Action Plan Session 1. Let's welcome to the stage Jeremy Hurst. Well, thanks, Andy. And uh, welcome club membership chairs, club presidents, and those of you just interested in growing membership to the initial bite-sized chunk session, as we're calling it, of the Zones 33-34 Membership Action Plan, or MAP, as it's known. My name, as Andy says, is Jeremy Hurst, and I am a director of Rotary International for 22-24 from your Zones 33 and 34. And this webinar series is intended to provide easy to implement steps to improve membership growth at the club level. So the vision of the Membership Action Plan team is to establish membership growth as a catalyst to fulfill Rotary International's vision, where together we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and probably most importantly, in ourselves. The realization came that while some clubs have succeeded in growing membership, many clubs needed a plan that they could easily follow that was immediately, immediately actionable and backed by real-time data. MAP offers a multi-year, data-driven, step-by-step plan to help our clubs achieve consistent, moderate membership growth. To give you the big picture, this membership system addresses the four areas that impact growth and experience has shown that growth is only achievable at club level if we focus on each of these four areas. The prospect pipeline, which is the focus of today's session, asks if you are consistently generating enough prospective members and shows you how to. Attraction poses the question, are we making a successful case to our prospects about what is important to them? That's to say, meaningful opportunities to serve, leadership opportunities, or an expanded network of friends or professional acquaintances, for example. Onboarding considers how we prepare new members for success. How do we make them feel welcome to Rotary and part of our amazing organization? How do we show them the opportunities that exist for them and match their passions with what Rotary and our clubs have to offer. And lastly, engagement. Is your club a friendly group or a group of friends? How do we keep our members involved and ensure they get the right return on their investment, creating value from, for them from their Rotary experiences? These monthly sessions will provide fundamental techniques to help all our clubs recover from the challenges of the past two years and provide a map to achieve consistent, moderate club membership growth. And please note that whilst these methods are proven to work, they aren't intended to replace the successful processes already in your club. In fact, we want to hear from you what's working. And along the way, we'll be finding ways to share, for you to share and to brag about your successes too. It's been proven that following the four steps of the MAP membership system will reduce attrition and increase retention, which, when combined with attracting new members, and that's important, will lead to the desired goal of consistent, moderate club membership growth. However, this isn't about simply increasing numbers. This is about making greater impact in the communities our clubs serve growing our networks and increasing our opportunities for fellowship. But this only happens when we have membership growth at the center of our priorities. As I said, we believe the Membership Action Plan gives club membership chairs and presidents the steps to do exactly that, allowing your club to unite more people and broaden lasting change. In short, to grow more and to do more thereby allowing your members to enjoy their Rotary experiences to the fullest. Today, we're going to share three strategies for creating a membership pipeline with you. We aren't expecting you to try and implement all of them. Find one that suits you and your club best and give it a try. We'll provide handouts afterwards with more details on implementation. Then a month or two later, try another and see how that works for your club. And a couple of months after that, try the third. 
keep running these plays throughout the year. This isn't a one and done activity. We want you to build these good membership habits into your club's culture year round and not just during membership month. So let me now pass over to Mike Dara, who's the Rotary Coordinator for Zone 34, to tell us more about how to create a membership pipeline. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Jeremy. We're gonna talk about three different ways to create a membership pipeline. I will present the first one. It's called, Who Do You Know? Then Chris Jones will show you how to do a gap analysis. And Terry Weaver will talk about the personal contact. The goal is to get people to identify a prospect, then get them to ask that person, and most important, to follow up. But first, how many leads does it take to gain one new member? The answer is it takes 10 leads to come up with a good group of prospects and then get one person out of that. 10 contacts make three good prospects, but of those three, it's normally about one is likely to join. It may not be the right time for the other two prospects. So keep them on your list. So how do you find the leads? How can you improve your success rate so it takes maybe less than 10 leads to gain one member? First, let's play, who do you know? At a club meeting, you pass out a three by five card to each person and you ask people, who do you know that would add value to our club? Now, this is really important. You have your member write their name on the card, and then they list maybe one, two, or as many as five potential Rotarians. It's a great time to have the different tables in your meeting brainstorm ideas together. It really is true that you get more ideas when you work together. So let me ask you, take out a scrap of paper, and as we talk, write down a name of someone who would make your club better. Maybe they enhance your club's connection to the community, or they have a love for serving, or they're really interesting people who love to interact with others. It's not easy to come up with a name when you don't have time to think, is it? Does it help you if I had a couple of other ideas? For example, some of the best Rotarians are friends, neighbors, coworkers, or someone you sell to. Chris Jones will be giving you some other ways to spark ideas for potential members when he talks about gap analysis, follow up with the proposer. So now that you have the names and the proposer, follow up about every three to four weeks to make sure the prospect is being asked to an event, an event that will resonate with the prospect. Many Rotarians aren't used to asking others to Rotary, so you may have to help by keeping it on their radar, just gently reminding them. And don't ask prospects up front to join Rotary. Ask them to come to something they'll enjoy, or even better, to an event where they can help. One final point. Your members might identify some great people, but none of your current members know them. That's okay. One club went from 28 members to 70 members in two years by creating a green room. That's where they placed these great contacts that would be wonderful for the club to have, but nobody knew them. Use those folks, put them off in that side area, and come back when somebody develops a personal contact for them. Terry will talk more about personal contact after Chris. All three of these ideas we're gonna to talk tonight can be used alone or they can be used in combination. Figure out what works for you. You'll find more ideas by following the links to the resources on the three slides on your screen. Now, to tell you how to do a gap analysis, I turn it over to Zone 33's past Rotary coordinator, Chris Jones. 
Mike, thank you so much for a great presentation on who do you know. It's an outstanding strategy that works very successfully when implemented consistently and followed up on regularly. What I'd like to share with you this evening is about performing in your club. And before I get into this and what it really is, let me set the stage a little bit. Let's say that a family member, spouse, parent, something like that, I ask you to go out and get some groceries from the grocery store. And that's all the information that you're given. Now think about this for a minute. You go off to a 50,000 square foot store and you're supposed to go inside, get some groceries and return home with them. What do you suppose your odds are of getting home with the desired groceries you were sent to acquire? Maybe 50-50 at best. Okay, so now let's say you were sent off to the grocery store to buy something only for dinner. Still not a lot of direction, but you're getting closer in terms of the desired meal group, but not so much about the food specifics. Maybe your odds are now sitting at about 70% of success. Finally, if you're sent off to this 50,000 square foot grocery store to get vegetables, now you have excellent odds of returning home with the intended groceries that you were sent to get. And this is all about being intentional. And that's what we're gonna talk about this evening in terms of identifying gaps in your club. So let's switch gears here and put this into action for our clubs. What I recommend is you gather a small group of your club members and list the type of businesses, vocations, and professions that are missing from your club. It could start with a commercial list of businesses or a chamber of commerce membership list or a book of lists. Most communities publish those annually. As this evolves to specific prospects in those businesses, focus on people with the same passion for service, not just position within the company. The best candidate for Rotary may not be the person who runs the business. Now let's get into a little bit of the how. What types of people make up our clubs? What professions do we currently have covered in our club? What professions are available in your market of your club that you do not currently have as members? Where do you find out all of this classification and profession um, information? Again, the Chamber of Commerce would be a great place to start. So this is where you, you really get started on this program of gap analysis by identifying the professions that are not represented in your club. Next thing we have to do is to identify who in the club knows someone that may work in that space or may so know someone who knows someone that works in that space. This process works very similar to the way that Mike talked about just a few minutes ago of who do you know. Hand out some three by five cards to your members, post a list using a projector or even writing the, mis the missing professions on a flip chart of the professions that your club wants to have represented in your membership. Then have your members write down the names of people they know that fill those positions. Have them place their own name in the top right corner of the index card. And I recommend you have your members take a photo of their own three by five card so they keep it with them and have it handy so that they know who they wrote down. But hand those cards into your membership chair so that your membership chair also has an active record of your new list of folks. So now ask the members to either reach out to the names they've listed or ask someone in the club to work with them on this process. And a quick note about that, not everyone likes calling on others about membership. Some in your club love doing this. It is suggested that you do not ask people to reach out to others if they're not comfortable. Let's let others who enjoy doing this do so. The member who prefers not to make the ask could even make an introduction to the member who will make the ask. So once you have, a, have your gap analysis lead gen list put together, then put a plan of action into place to follow up on those leads. The gold is in the follow-up. If McDonald's only ever ran one commercial, would they have sold billions of hamburgers? So again, the gold is in the follow-up. So Terry Weaver is gonna to come to us now and speak more about making a personal ask. 
and I don't want to take too much of his thunder away. So let me stop here and introduce Zone 33's current Rotary Coordinator, Terry Weaver. Thanks, Chris. As you realize, our membership program today is focused on the first success principle of a Rotary Club's membership system, and that's building this pipeline of prospects. Now, just to be clear, we're not looking for just anybody. We're looking for more of the same quality people we have in Rotary today, as well as expanding our reach to underrepresented groups in our communities. Happily, quality people know quality people. They hang around with quality friends. They have quality customers. They have quality suppliers. They have quality neighbors and family members. And we've discussed two tried and true strategies for prompting your members to bring those quality Rotary prospects to the table. And here's a third. We call it the personal ask. Now, you want to ask from the podium. You want to ask in your club newsletter. You want to ask in emails, always reminding your members that we need them to be talking about Rotary with people they know and introducing those people to Rotary. Trouble is, many members hear or read those messages from the podium, in a newsletter, in an email, and they think you're talking to someone else. They don't take them as a personal ask. What we mean by a personal ask is a real one-on-one -on -one conversation on the phone, in person, between a club leader and a club member. That club leader might be the club president, a membership chair, a board member, or a well-known high-profile member. In a larger club, you may split this up between several board members, for example. You can just buttonhole somebody following a Rotary meeting or at a service project or call them on the phone. Now, you don't need to make this up on your own. We have a script for that. Just search personal on the Zone website just like what you see on the screen. Search on personal and you'll find a script that goes something like this. Hi, Jeremy. Is this an okay time for a call? Are you tied up with something? I always start a phone call with that question. Is this an okay time for a call? I learned that from times that I started into the conversation and then the person says, oh, oh, I got to do this, do that, whatever. I got to stop. I got to break off. Then, of course, it's hard to get back in the game. So I'm talking to Jeremy and saying, Jeremy, you know, we really have a great Rotary. I love this club. I love coming to our meetings. I love seeing people like you and the rest of our members. But frankly, at its current size, we've let this club shrink down to about just below 20 members. And I'm thinking it's long-term sustainability is really in jeopardy. We seem to just sort of be aging out together. And it also strikes me, we could do a whole lot more for our community if we had, say, 10 more members. If we were a 30-member club instead of a 20-member club, think of what that would look like. So I'm asking you for your help. I need your help to get there. I need you to bring me one, only one, potential Rotarian to a Rotary Information Hour. We're going to call those Discover Rotary. Or to a service project, one or the other, in, say, the next couple of months. Can I count on you doing this, Jeremy, not only for the club, but also for me? And, and how can I help you get a list together of people you can invite to one or more of our membership events? Now, of course, you're acquainted with the person you're calling, so there'll be other things in between these sort of talking points, but you get the idea. We need to start with why, why it is important that our Rotary Club consistently, moderately grows rather than shrinks. Then we need to talk about what kind of people we're looking for in order to grow that Rotary Club, these quality Rotarians, similar to the quality of Rotarians you already have on the books. Folks, this will work. I've done this. What you're trying to do is prompt and inspire your members to bring prospects to the table, preferably to a Rotary Information Hour where they can learn something about Rotary. You'll hear a lot more about that next month or maybe to a service project where they can experience Rotary close up and personal. It's, it's personally not my recommendation that you invite a prospect to a club meeting. Now that I know is a tried and true and failed strategy of, of old. And the reason for that folks is that when you invite somebody to a Rotary meeting, how many of the minutes in a Rotary meeting do we spend talking about what Rotary is about? It's, it's certainly easy for a guest or a potential member to visit a Rotary meeting and know absolutely nothing more about Rotary when they leave than when they came in. So let's invite them to something where they can learn something about us. Okay, let's recap. We presented three strategies 
Now, these are each guaranteed to help you prompt and inspire your members to bring prospects to the table. I'm saying guaranteed because we've seen clubs do all three of these things successfully. So the first is an exercise you can do during, say, the opening, the run-up to a club meeting before you ring the bell, or perhaps at a club assembly. And you're asking your members, who do you know? Asking them to invite those people to an event. The second is identifying these gaps in your membership where you're missing an industry, vocation, some business types or professions, and asking your members to specifically target their prospecting efforts on those segments. That does work a whole lot better than just think of somebody who would be a good Rotarian. And then there's the personal ask. Yeah, I give you the, I, I give it to you. That, that is some work for those doing the asking. But you know, folks, building membership is some work. You have to add energy to a business to grow it. You have to add energy to a Rotary Club to grow it. So the person that's doing that ask might be the president, the membership chair, a couple of board members. It's some work for them. But I got to tell you, the yield on that personal conversation beats 10 podium announcements, plus 10 emails, plus 10 bulletin articles. That one conversation will get you some prospects. Now, remember, no matter how you build your pipeline of prospect names, use your member management platform, something like DACDB or Club Runner, to enter and keep track of those names. Track those names, phone numbers, email addresses, and sponsor names. Now you got this, right? You need an intentional strategy, perhaps one of these three, to get members to bring prospects to the table. And then you need to use a club-wide platform to keep track of those prospects. You got this, right? So next month's topic. Next month's topic is connect with prospects. That's on to September 12th. Same time, five o'clock in the evening. And we'll answer questions like, how do you create an event where you'll invite those prospects and they'll feel inspired and attracted to Rotary? Here's a hint. It's something other than a club meeting. What do you tell them? What do you ask them? So for right now, start executing your plan to identify and capture prospect contact information. We'll bring you the next bite-sized step of this program next month, where we'll talk about how to connect with those prospects. Thank you very much, Terry. And going back a little bit, this gap analysis is a nice, fancy wording, but this is coming from something we've done in the past. So I'm gonna throw this question over to Chris. We've often heard it as a classification analysis and our older Rotarians in tenure, not age, Speak a little bit about classification, using the same wording as gap analysis as to a way to find persons that are not in our clubs. Oddly, thanks for the question. And classification is, in the long time ago days of Rotary was how we diversified our club by having different people from different professions in our club. And the gap analysis is really just another way to create diversification in our club, not only diversification in terms of different types of professions, but diversification in different types of ideas. Um, and it just gets us more quality members into our club. I have this question I'm going to pass over through to Terry. Who is the best person from your experience in our club to get prospects, to seek prospects? Is it everyone in the club should? Should we divert it only to the club membership committee? What are your thoughts on that? Rotary is a membership organization. And it's a membership organization that was built from a core of four people. Your Rotary Club started with a core of four people and it built to whatever it took to get chartered, probably 25 members at the time. And some of your Rotary Clubs built to hundreds of members. You know, that didn't happen because just one or two people were working at it. What you want to do is inspire and engage all of your members to at least come up with prospects, even if they're unwilling to contact those people. Figure out a way that you can at least get some names on the table. Now, granted, it is a whole lot more effective if the prospect that George knows is called by George. But if that's completely out of the question, I'm okay with calling somebody up and saying, 
Hey, Max, my name's Terry Weaver. I'm part of the Rotary Club of Greenville, and I've known George for years and years through that club, and I've we've really enjoyed each other. I just, I, I just, I love the stories he tells, and I know you're a friend of George. And I wonder if you come to an event where you just learn a little bit more about our rope, no obligation, just to come spend an hour with us before lunch, then join us for lunch, and I'll see if George can come along as well. Uh, is, is that something that you might have an interest in? That's how that goes. You can now start drip marketing those same people just the way Amazon does to you. Uh, but I wouldn't do it quite that often. Maybe once a month, you send that list of potential members either some information about an upcoming service project that they might be interested in helping out with, or you send them one copy of your club bulletin, your club newsletter, say once a month. And what that does is just pop set Rotary brand in front of them. And of course, that means that this, this person that I called a friend of George, and we talked about Rotary a little bit, and he didn't bite on that one. But after, say, four or six or eight months of getting a little ping from my Rotary Club once a month, he might even bring it up with George and say, hey, you know, I, I might be interested in looking at that. So that's a good way to start is harvest those prospect names and enter them in DACDB as potential members. All you need is first name, last name, email address, and mobile phone number. That's all I ask my members for. First name, last name, mobile phone, email address. You can cover the rest from there. What other simple solutions have you seen over the years just to keep these prospects in line? Some way how to keep in touch with them to invite them to a Rotary event. Well, thanks, Audley. Great question. I was thinking that when it was answered by uh, Chris earlier. So, so it, it actually takes me back to my first day in sales uh, when my sales manager uh, sat me down and said, I'm going to give you the best asset that I've got for you to be able to make contact with the connection with clients. And he pulled out a, a telephone directory, Yellow Pages, and dropped it on the desk in front of me. He said, start at A and work your way through. Um, so there are databases out there, other databases other than um, other than obviously the Chamber of Commerce. And we have access to internet now as well. And, you know, so I think you can use all of those, um, all of those opportunities at hand. Um, I, I, one thing I do want to say as well is let's not just limit this, this to um, professionals. I mean, in terms of uh, where we're going, uh, what we're really looking for are, are, are people in action. <laughs> Um, President Jen likes to say the people we, sh we should be focusing on are, not, are people of action, people of influence, and people of purpose. And I think we should really um, look at those criteria as the primary ones. It may be that there's a there's a housewife who's done an amazing job, comes straight out of a, of a career, uh, or maybe out of a uh, uh, former career or out of education um, and out of a degree and, and hasn't gone into a, a current job who would be, make an amazing look here. So I think we need to be broader in terms of the way we see, uh, seek our members and look at prospective members in terms of the qualities. And I think there are people out there that, as you say, that we know that we should be really looking for that qualification first, that, that prospective Rotarian at heart uh, that we know that um, we, we turn into as we become members. Um, so let's just not limit it to the telephone directories or the general commerce. Let's think broader and wider about who would be a good fit for our clubs and really make a difference in our communities. Thank you very much. And I'm also seeing Mike. Um, Mike is spotlighted as well, just in relation to there's a cluster of clubs close in one spot or a cluster of clubs close in a particular city. And if you find a club or two kind of competing against for that one particular prospect. Well, what's interesting, when I hear that from other people, you're starting a new club is when you really hear it. Oh, they're going to compete with members. And my question to people is, how often have you asked someone and they've said, oh, no, I've been asked by another club? Our market penetration in most areas, on average, is about 0.01%. That leaves a lot of room for finding people. If you are in a small area, then differentiating your club so that you make certain that the person joins the right club for that person, that takes somebody who really has the rotary spirit to say, you know, it's really great. I think you're a great fit, but don't you have conflicts during lunch? 
what do you think about this club that meets at night? When you develop that, many areas use a president's council and the presidents get together and establish that rapport so that they do refer to each other. And that's fantastic. So thanks for that. And a quick follow-up in relation to your segment when you spoke, a club that have used those manual cards. Share with us, possibly based on your experience as well, the most successful club that have used it, how did they do it? And you know what kind of prospects and how did they build their pipeline using those, those, those index cards? So the index card is, my experience, best used in a club assembly. It's also best used when you give the people in the audience a good chance of figuring out what sort of person works well in our club? Most people don't sit back and think, oh, you know what? We really need people who enjoy service in this area or who are especially interesting in this area. Most clubs have to sit back and think. And well, frankly, I've oftentimes sat and brainstormed with a diverse group of the club, with the membership committee and a diverse group to say, what is our club? What sorts of members do we need? We brainstorm it, we prioritize. And my club personally came out with, we want leaders with a heart for service. But those sorts of things that people can get their head around and think, oh, that works. The other thing that people did at the session that was very successful, I mentioned at your individual tables, to have the people work at their tables and start throwing out ideas about who would be good. That frequently will generate many more ideas than just somebody who gets handed a card and you say, okay, hand this in at the end of the meeting. If you do that, you're not gonna get much anywhere and you will definitely not get anywhere if they don't hand the card in. Thank you. So again, there are different options that we're sharing here and the idea is to just get into the nuts and bolts as to what clubs can do and just share thoughts around that. And if a club or a club member or club president is on the call right now and you're already doing these things, that's fantastic. Keep at it. The idea is to just share best practices today from the you know, wonderful panelists that are here as well too. So I just want to share another thought before we wrap because we're going to be closing and we possibly have another, possibly one more question. I've seen a club use the or seven areas of focus to assist with prospecting, looking at merging that concept with classification or the gap analysis. Because oftentimes we can prospect, but that particular person or profession might not be able to come to a lunch meeting or a breakfast meeting or an evening meeting for that matter, or even gathering. So have you seen, I'm not sure I'm going to throw this one to possibly Jeremy or Chris, have you seen clubs use the areas of focus to assist with prospecting? Because if we share with persons about, we're doing maternal and child health and educational literacy, we might be speaking to passionately a prospective Rotarian who is a medical doctor or a teacher, but those folks might not be able to come to a meeting at the specific time. So let's share some thoughts around using to assist with the gap analysis, the areas of focus while we're prospecting. So I'll pass it to Jeremy and possibly Chris. Thanks, Lord. It's an, it's an absolutely great idea. And it, and it, talks, it goes to what I was talking about earlier about understanding what a uh, prospect is looking for from Rotary and matching what we're able to deliver as an organization with their needs to give them a return on investment, give them, get them to get maximum value. So I, I, I love it as a concept. Uh, I, I have to say the only time I've probably seen it used recently is with some of the innovative clubs where they're cause-based and they perhaps fall into those areas of focus for clubs on the environment, for example, uh, on, on child and maternal health care. And, and I think there are opportunities for that going forward. So, that, you know, what it's all about is us giving our members a return on the investment, given making sure their rotary membership experience is of massive value to them. Uh, and we can best do that if we match their needs um, to what we're able to offer. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, but uh, I think it's a great idea. Thanks. Yeah. And, well, and oddly, I'll sure. add to that. Um, if we perform service projects that have an area of focus 
to it. It's uh, service projects are a great opportunity to attract members to Rotary. And uh, that's why our service projects, when we engage the community, we, we get a number of members coming to us out of those because they get to see Rotary in action. So we, we do wanna make sure that we're including our community in any of those service projects that we're doing. Thank you for another wonderful session. Thank you all to the panelists here today, just to sharing your expertise.